good morning and welcome. Grateful you are here as we gather to worship the Lord on this Lord's Day morning as a congregation. Good to be back with you. Missed you last week, but heard that Richard Thomas did well. I wouldn't expect anything else, of course. But it's nice to be able to swap with him and have a opportunity to preach a, a previous message when you're at GA. There's real, no real time to do anything like that. So grateful that uh, he could come and preach and I could preach in his place. GA went well. Typically the clerk puts out a report where he says, all right, this is everything that happened. And once that report drops, I'll pass that on to you. You can know what business was conducted uh, during that week. But grateful to be back today uh, after being away last Sunday and the previous week. Dale is preaching in Knoxville this morning at a PCA church. Let's keep him uh, in prayer. But since he's away and others are away, you, you get an extra dose of me leading and, and teaching and preaching. So uh, glad to be back. Glad to see you. We'll enjoy this time together. Quickly, the announcements. Just a reminder to the elders that are here. We'll gather together after this service. So we'll have our monthly meeting today. After this service, short agenda, so it won't keep you too long, uh, we'll go over to Aaron's Sunday School room, the room with the TV, as soon as we finish uh, in here this morning. Next Sunday, we have the privilege of a guest missionary, a gentleman by the name of Brian Moore, who is a missionary to Germany with Mission to the World, our, uh, the PCA's missions agency. He's been serving in Germany for a few years, and now they've asked him to start a church in another section of Germany, and he's going to come here and present. We're excited about meeting him and, and being able to pray for him. And then lastly, if you are able to serve in the church nursery, you don't do it currently, but you would be able to help with that ministry, please come and see me. We're, we're thankful that we have the need uh, of our nursery again. That, that is a answer to prayer, a blessing of the Lord, uh, but it would help to be able to add to our workers, some have come off, and uh, it would be good to be able to replace them and add others as well, uh, if possible. So if you could do that, see me, and I'll talk to you about how to get signed up and the training we do and get you as a part of that rotation. All right. Take your bulletin. Please turn to the front. We have here a responsive reading. God, through his word, calls us to worship. Let's read this responsively as we come into the Lord's presence. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? One who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the grace of God the Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So come, let us worship this Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we call on your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, that's who you are, and we adore you this morning, that the Father loves us, has purposed salvation, that the Son loves us and has come and accomplished salvation, and the Spirit loves us and has been poured out to indwell us and the church to Give us the presence of God to be with us, to bring us into the presence of the Son and the Father, and to enable us to worship that one God and three persons. What a beautiful mystery, and yet what a mystery that tells us the good news of salvation. So it's that triune name we call on. We call upon the one God this morning and ask you to be present in our worship and to make us fit to be in your presence. Give us clean hands and pure hearts. Forgive us of our sins, for we are not clean. Work that in us. Thank you that connected to Christ, we have it objectively as our position. So we come before that God, we come into your presence, and we call on you, asking you to glorify yourself, to make yourself known 
to be mighty, to be great, to receive our worship, to receive our praise, and to give us grace in this time. And we pray it in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 455. And can it be that I should gain hymn 455? Stand with me, please.
take your order of worship. Let's confess our faith together as the people of God. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Thanks together. Father in heaven, we recognize again everything we have comes from your hand. You made all things, you govern all things, you do it for your glory, you do it for the good of your people, you, in a special way, take care of your church. And we are thankful for that. You also send rain and sun on the just and the unjust. You are kind, and we thank you for all that you do in the way. Uh, you do it in a way that benefits your people. We give you our thanks. So thank you for recent safe travels uh, up to GA and back again. Other folks in the church who have done summer travel and known your safe care. We thank you for that. We thank you for the ongoing work of the church here. Thank you for a great time yesterday with the outreach time in the neighborhoods nearby. Thank you for the ongoing work of renovation and good progress there. Please continue to bless it and bring it to the end that you have determined. Thank you for providing for our church. We've had the funds we need to be able to do what we've sought to do over these years, and you have provided. And for that, we give you our thanks. We do pray you would 
Continue that provision, increase it, and help us to use it well for the glory of God. As we continue to worship and give our thanks to you in both prayer and song, receive our thanks and be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing this hymn of thanksgiving, expressing thanks to God with this song. In Christ alone, the tune is familiar and the words are printed here in your order of worship. Let's sing this together. I'll read the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. You can listen as God's word is read. And then we'll have a time of silent prayer before I lead us. Hearing God's law gives us the opportunity to hear where we have not obeyed God. The law functions in order to show us that we cannot on our own please God with our good works. It shows us we need to confess and receive the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. The law of God is also good. It shows us how we might live our lives in obedience to God. So while we are not perfect, yet it guides us in a good way. We are brought to confession. We hear the voice of pardon. The voice of pardon moves us to obey. That is the rhythm of the Christian life. So let's hear God's word from Exodus 20. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, 
but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's pray silently for a moment. Lord God, we acknowledge before you on the basis of what your law says that we cannot on our own please you. We can't earn our salvation, and as Christians, we cannot increase in favor with God or, or, or gain a standing over others or think that we have something to boast in by our obedience. You love us, and on that basis, we have salvation because you loved us and you gave your one and only Son. So we thank you for Christ, and we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, and you would help us to find all of our rest in you. Forgive us of self-righteousness. Forgive us of rebellion. Lord, thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit, who convinces our hearts that the law is good. So forgive us for when we don't see it as good. Forgive us for when we see it as an obstacle or a burden or something that's Tiresome, help us to delight in your commands and to find joy in keeping them. Give us wisdom knowing how to apply them to all of life. And help us to yield all of life to you. You are pleased when your children <laughs> obey you. So we are pleased. You are pleased through Christ, and yet you are pleased when we obey you through Christ. So help us to do that and to find delight in doing so. And again, forgive us. We sin when we don't. Forgive us of those sins, we pray. Lord, we would also ask you to remember those who might be in need today in our church. We intercede for them. So we think of Dale out preaching at, in Knoxville. Pray you would bless him and fill him with your spirit. Pray for our friend Tosh Gross on the candidates committee with me and Rick trying to get over COVID after more than a month of dealing with it. And its effects. I pray you show mercy to that brother and make strengthen his body. I pray you get better, be able to get back to work. I pray you get sleep at night, and you would help him to know your mercy. Thank you that he has gotten somewhat better. May the mercies continue. Pray for our brother Rod Hendricks that he would recover well uh, from the surgery a few weeks ago. You would meet the needs of him and his family. Pray for Mike Linderman, Sharon's husband, with his back surgery about a month ago now that he would recover well and be able to do, enjoy his days without the burden of that pain. Pray for ministers that do the work of God. Thank you for Sammy Rhodes at USC and Richard Thomas over at Mount Calvary, especially his help last week. Pray you would bless those men, that you would bless their families, that they would serve you well, that there would be fruit for their ministry, and that you would meet every need they may have. Pray for the brother at Richard's Church who's studying to be their youth worker. Pray you would bless him as he advances in his preparation. And as we come now to your words, we open the word of God and read it and preach it. Would you again give us understanding and work in our hearts to respond to it? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And hear the assurance of pardon. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Amen. Let's look this morning at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
Not starting a new series yet, so we're not going through the book of First Timothy. I'd like, since we finished the Psalms, I usually like to have a few one-off sermons, whatever the right word is, not part of a series before we jump into another book. So we'll do that for a few weeks. Though we even in these being, again, not, not a series strictly speaking, uh, they will be held together by the idea of the gospel and a gospel-centered church, what a gospel-centered ministry would look like. That's a theme that will recur and what we'll look at over the next few weeks. So 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 to 11, will be our focus today. Let's hear God's word. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. In 1993, a new phrase appeared in the American military lexicon, the phrase mission creep. The phrase was used in two articles in the Washington Post and one in the New York Times commenting on America's expanding involvement in Somalia. Maybe some of you remember these events. Late in 1992, towards the end of his term, President George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, dispatched 28,000 troops to Somalia to feed starving children and give humanitarian aid in the war-torn nation. However, in June of 1993, the intervention was converted into a UN operation whose growing objectives included seeking long-term stability in the country and capturing warlord Mohammed Idid. In October 1993, 18 American soldiers died at the Battle of Mogadishu, leading to a more defensive presence in Somalia and the eventual withdrawal of U.S. forces in early 1994. Now, there's probably a larger political debate behind those actions, and I'm not commenting on that. I probably even missaid some of the names. This was when I was younger. I don't remember this as a child. But my point was to highlight how this scenario generated the phrase mission creep, which refers to the gradual or incremental expansion of a project beyond its original scope, focus or goals. Mission creep is spawned by initial success, but is considered undesirable due to how each success breeds more ambitious interventions until a final failure happens, which stops the intervention entirely. Well, mission creep can happen in a war. You see how that phrase arose from the U.S. intervention in Somalia. But mission creep can also happen, say, in a nonprofit business and even in a church. The church, experiencing success in its original endeavors, can start to creep beyond its original mission to the point that is in danger of failure. A little over 10 years ago, the PCA released a 10-year strategic plan, which was intended to help focus our mission as a denomination. 
And in the plan, they make a distinction, a helpful distinction, between formal and animating values. They tell you what those are. Formal values are the official values you adopt in your standards, like a mission statement. What you say you are about. Animating values are the values that stimulate your daily activities. In other words, they're the real values that get you up each morning and guide your actions, what you really care about. And those two sets of values can be quite different. For example, in the strategic planning document, the authors list several animating values that drive ministry in many churches. And this is descriptive. This isn't a list that says this is what it ought to be. This is the PCA looking around in our churches and saying, okay, we think we see these values that drive many churches. Let me just list a few of them. Everyone understanding and applying scripture, perpetuating and refining reformed theology, worshiping God rightly and well, involving everyone in personal evangelism, Everyone grasping the grace of the gospel, multiplying healthy churches, transferring the faith to the next generation, transforming culture, support of Christian schooling, reclaiming the nation for Christ, supporting Christian artists, supporting pro-life movements, creating Christian community, racial reconciliation, supporting mission work, revival through vital repentance and faith, predominant personal piety, separation from unbelief, church growth, and the always helpful other. Now, there's a lot of good things in that list, but it begs the question, where should we focus our efforts? What values should drive our ministry as a church? And maybe throughout your life, different churches you've been in or visited, you could see, oh yeah, some different churches just tend to be driven sometimes by different things. So which ones should drive the church? What are the core values that should animate our actions as a church and as Christians? Well, in our passage today, Paul gives us the goal of Christian ministry. And this passage functions like a well-designed sign. Focus your attention on the main information you need to take away. And just to be clear, the point of the focus is not to dismiss everything else. It's not to dismiss other applications. It's not to dismiss other truths. It's not to say, hey, we'll ignore those. Those don't matter. But here's the point of the focus. When you get the core right... All the other values fall into place. When you make your schedule in the morning, you figure out, okay, what, is, what must I do today? And then you can shake the things around it. They talk about, you know, can, can you put a jar, can you get all this sand and all these rocks into the jar? If you put the sand in first, the rocks just stack up. So they say you put the big rocks in first, and then the sand will fill in the edges around it. What are the big rocks? What are the core values? that we should embrace as a church. This passage gets us started on putting down some of our anchors. So let's give our attention to the passage and answer the question, what is the goal of our ministry? And Paul gives us three answers. First, to oppose false teaching that cannot save you. In verses 3 to 4, Paul first mentioned, he first mentions a negative aspect of Christian ministry. Now, not negative in, in the sense of bad, but negative in the sense of something Christian ministry should oppose, something Christian ministry should seek to end. And it's something that takes place inside the walls of the church. So we might be prone to think, oh yeah, something we should end out there. The first thing Paul gives us is something to end in here. Verse 3 reads, As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Timothy's first mandate is to put an end to false teaching in Ephesus. 
This is something Paul urged Timothy to do. And urge doesn't mean encourage or recommend. It's something Paul expects Timothy to do. Paul and Timothy had been working together in Ephesus, and when Paul moved on to a new location in Macedonia, he told Timothy, you stay here, you pastor this church. And priority number one, put an end to false teaching in the church. Now that, we might be tempted to take that concept and go in any direction we want, right? Okay, yeah, we're against false teaching. Let's talk about all the bad false teachings that are out there. But Paul's words imply he has certain kinds of false teaching in mind. Now, he doesn't name them specifically, but he does give us some clues. So verse 4 begins, Or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Devotion to myths and endless genealogies, that describes the false teaching referred to at the end of verse 3. In other words, Timothy put an end to false teaching based in myths and endless genealogies. And I'd submit those two words describe two kinds of false teaching. So first, if you've ever read Greek myths, you know the gods behave in all sorts of immoral ways. The philosopher Plato used the word myth to denounce certain stories not simply as false, but also deceptive, in that they were told so as to lend credence to immoral behavior or practices by linking them to ancient stories about the gods. In other words, myths could be used to justify immoral behavior. Well, such and such a God did it, so it's okay for me. Even certain Greek philosophers are recognizing that. Socrates was put to death because he said, look, we need to allegorize some of these myth stories. It's not proper for gods to act in this way. And they said that's submersive, and he was put to death. So the point is, myths can be used to justify immoral behavior. And if you're wondering, well, what kind of immoral behavior? Just glance again at the vice list of verses 9 to 10. Such sins should not be practiced by God's people. So resist any kind of teaching that provides an open door to immorality. Secondly, Paul refers to endless genealogies. Now, when you read your Old Testament, or the opening chapters of Matthew and Luke, you encounter genealogies, don't you? Is Paul saying, well, you just skip over those parts of the Old Testament. They don't matter. No, Paul's referring to extra biblical books, books that took the genealogies, and, and there are records of these. I have them in my office if you want to see them. Books that took the Old Testament stories, took the Old Testament genealogies, and kind of mined those narratives for clues about a deeper sort of piety. And if you read these extra biblical books, they're very legalistic. They're very much like, don't do this and avoid this. And here's the problem. They go beyond what is written. They go beyond the Bible. And they produce a false piety. Now, Paul actually gives an example of this right here in 1 Timothy. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Probably just across the page. Chapter 4, look at verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. This false teaching forbids things that God permits. It withholds God's good gifts like marriage and meat. It withholds them from believers when believers should know. That God's creation gifts are to be received with thanksgiving. Now, here's the point. Here's the significance of Paul's words. He says, I want you to forbid false teaching 
that leads either to lawlessness and immorality or to false extra-biblical piety. He does not view one of those options as safer than the other. And I think that's something we struggle with. Immorality, yes, that's bad, and it is. But if we tipped on this side of things and maybe being a little over-restrictive, well, at least that's a safe option. Paul says, no way. He, he is opposed to any doctrine and any ethics that is not founded on God's word. Why? Because they lead us away from the gospel. Look at the end of verse 4. Paul says, such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And that phrase there, God's work, it refers to God's salvation plan. The outworking of God's plan of salvation through the gospel and through the communication of the gospel. In other words, what is God up to in the church? What is God doing? He is furthering his saving plan. He is doing it through the preaching of the gospel. How do humans come to participate in that plan? By faith. In other words, friends, God's saving purposes are accomplished by faith, not false, unbiblical teaching that either softens the biblical message on sin or adds extra biblical rules that people need to keep by their own works. Sinclair Ferguson, he has a great article. I'll send it to you if you want. It's solid gold where he discusses the relationship between legalism and antinomianism. Now, legalism, strictly speaking, it's the idea of salvation by works, or it can become a temptation to Christians who think, I, I increase in favor with God by obeying his law or even by obeying extra rules. Like, I can gain a foothold with God by what I do. Now, antinomianism is the error that says, all right, Christian, you have no obligation to obey God. You don't even have to obey God's law. That's all done. Those rules are gone for your conscience and your conduct. Just kind of do what your heart says, or it's all about the inside. Just you don't have to obey God's law. Rules always kill. Biblical rules, that is. Ferguson's main point is we tend to view these two errors as opposites. But in reality, they're very similar. Why? Because they are both antithetical to grace. And when a person realizes, you know what, I, I've been a little bit of a legalist, they're tempted to say, well, I'll just add a dose of antinomianism. That will balance me out. And if I've been an antinomian and want to take obeying God seriously, well, I'll just add a little dose of legalism. No. The error stands side by side. And the solution to both is to understand and enjoy your union with Jesus Christ. Ferguson writes, union with Christ leads to a new love for and obedience to God's law. Because the bonds of legalism has been broken. I no longer view the law as this taskmaster and there's no mercy and it's just doing its job of condemning. That's all it can do. No, now I view the law through Christ. I'm fully forgiven and the spirit enables me to obey God. And so I don't go down the path of antinomianism because I realize that law comes from the hand of Christ. And the Spirit writes it in my heart. In other words, we, we tend to think of error. When we tend to think of error or we tend to think of trajectories, we always think of them moving in one direction, don't we? And it's usually from strict to loose. Friends, error can move in any direction. The solution is to stay tightly tethered to the biblical text and to oppose any error that opposes the gospel and to embrace the teaching alone that can save. Which brings me naturally to the second goal of Christian ministry. To emphasize the gospel so that you become a loving person. Paul says in verse 5, Now, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience 
and a sincere faith. You, you see in this verse, this is the big idea that shapes the whole sermon. Why put an end to false teaching? Why give attention to advancing God's redemptive work by faith? What would be the result of a biblical gospel-centered ministry? Paul's answer, love. Now, I'm not going to lie. That answer surprised me. I would have expected faithfulness or orthodoxy or God being glorified, you know, getting it right in the church. I would have expected those things. And don't get me wrong, all of those are in the Bible, if not right here later in 1 Timothy. But what does Paul lead with? What attribute does he put in the middle? He highlights love. The goal of right teaching and gospel ministry is to produce love among God's people. Of course, Paul doesn't tell us which love he has in mind, love for God or, or love for people, but maybe that's on purpose so that we would realize both. You've probably all read this passage more than once, but I'm going to refer to it again. When the scribe asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus answered, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. When the scribe asked Jesus, all right, well, which one's the most important? He means from which can all the others be derived? In other words, which commandment is the most foundational? And that's not just an academic question. His job as a scribe is to study the law so that people can keep it. Jesus' answer states, you know what? Because there's one God who uniquely loves his people and has saved them by his grace, then his people should love him with all their heart soul, strength, and mind. And they should love their neighbors as they love themselves. You see, there's one God, and that one God loves all of you, all of his being. And as he has shown love and grace to you, so you show the same love and grace to others. And those two commandments, that is the essence of what God wants from his people. And again, it is easy to undersell this point in preaching. I've actually preached on this passage before, but I hardly gave any attention to the emphasis that Paul does here on love. It's like I was reading and studying the passage, and my eyes was glazed over. Oh, this is like the high point of the text. Totally underdeveloped the point. Why is that? Why, why, do, why are we naturally inclined maybe to overlook love? Maybe we fear to talk about love. Maybe we associate, well, churches that talk about love, those are those doctrinally squishy churches or the ethically compromised churches. Maybe. But love is at the heart of the Christian faith. Love alone endures into eternity. Love is perfectly compatible with faithfulness to truth. They're not enemies. They're friends. But it must not be diminished. We must not merely assume it. Oh, well, of course we do that. The goal of Christian ministry is love. So how do I cultivate that kind of love? Paul says in verse 5, This love comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. I'll give you the definitions quickly. A pure heart, that's the inner part of you that's been cleansed by God. So it's who you really are, what you love, what you want, what, what determines what you do. And, and Paul is saying God changes that. A good conscience, that's the decision-making part of you. And it produces actions that are in line with the gospel. Now, this is really interesting because your discernment between right and wrong, your conscience, your sense of right and wrong, it should be shaped and put into action by the gospel. That's why Paul says it needs to be a good conscience. Not everyone's conscience is good. Your conscience needs to be regulated by the scriptures, by gospel teaching. And the irony is the false teachers, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make people more pious. They think, well, this will help 
This will put the guardrails in place that need to be there. Paul's irony is actually it can't produce that end. So while they're trying to make you a better person, it's actually making you worse. It won't get you to your goal. And that's why I said, I, I think we're tempted to think, well, a little false teaching in that area, well, that would be okay. It would have good results. No, it will actually produce the opposite and fail to accomplish its goal. So that lastly, sincere faith, well, that's exactly what it sounds like. True faith in God and the gospel. And those three ingredients, those are the components of a person who's been changed on the inside by the grace of God. And the result will be love for God. And love for one's neighbor. And the goal of this ministry should be to see that love produce. We, we should see it as fruit and we should make it our goal. So let me give this last idea quickly. And we will close. The last goal is to assure you that God transforms you by the gospel. There is hope for obedient living through the gospel. Not the doctrines of man. In verses 6 and 7, Paul again mentions the false teachers. He says they've departed from these gospel ideas. They've turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they are talking about. So see, that they want to teach the law. They want to get people to be pious. But Paul says they don't know what they're doing. So in verses 8 through 11, Paul says, here's what they should be doing. It's kind of implied, but, but follow the logic here. He says, they want to be teachers of the law. They don't know what they're doing. Here's how you rightly use the law. Verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Well, what would a proper use of the law look like? Look at verses 9 and 10. We also know that the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the holy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. The implication is this. The purpose of the law in gospel ministry is to show sinners their sin so that they come to Christ for salvation. We don't put the law in front of people and say, all right, try your best to be good like this. Keep trying, do better, try harder. No, we put the law in front of people so that they will realize, I can't do it. But Jesus has done it for them, and he will save them from their sins. Now, by the way, at this point, if you're listening and you know your theology, you may say, oh, wait, 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 wait. I thought we believed Christians should obey God's law, and I said that 20 minutes ago. Do we, okay, do we believe that? And why do we believe that based on this passage? Yes, we do believe that. And here's an irony. You will find Paul admonishing Christians to obey these very commands over in Romans 13. And he will say there, this is an expression of your love for one another. So there is a role of the law that guides us in how we love. But... When it comes to preaching the gospel, the law's first function is to show you how much you need Jesus Christ. And even as a Christian, then to say, look, true transformation in life, true transformation in your behavior, that will come from the grace of God. We cannot produce these things merely by telling you, Go obey rules or laws. That's why Paul concludes the way he does in verse 11. He says, this accords, all, everything I've just said, this accords with the glorious gospel of the blessed God that was entrusted to me. In other words, when I talk about the condemning function of the law, Paul says that fits the gospel that Christ taught me. Salvation and transformation come first and foremost by the grace of God. We can't accomplish them with law alone. And so here's what that means for you. Maybe you're practicing those sins, whichever one it may be. If you are, there is hope for you. You don't have to hide. You don't have to keep it a secret. You don't have to pretend that everything is okay. Come and talk to us. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your elders. 
Let us share the good news of God's forgiveness and grace. Let us share with you the hope that Jesus forgives and transforms people like this. We are all sinful to the core. We can never obey God enough to earn salvation, but God's redemptive plan grounded in the finished work of Jesus Christ, it truly transforms sinners by faith, not by good deeds. If you're a young person, or maybe you've grown up in church, there is grace for you as well. It's easy to kind of make the assumption that when you grow up in church, you, you learn these things from the earliest days, and so you try to keep the rules, you try to do right, and maybe it comes uh, from a good place. But then you begin to realize, well, I fail. I don't do everything just right. And, and it's almost the way we talk sometimes. It's like church, okay, hey, grace, that's for the outsiders. Come in and get the grace. Now, for all of you in the room, well, you should know better. Well, I guess on one level, we should know better. But there is still grace for those who know better. So if you've grown up in church and around the gospel and learn much, there is still grace. And so ground your relationship with God in the gospel and in what he has done for you. Yes, obey God. Obey it on the basis of what he's done for you. That will actually move you and transform you into one who loves God wholeheartedly. And so lastly, church, what values animate our ministry? Are we known by the gospel? Are we characterized by love? Does the gospel shape our direction? Is that what gets us going in the ministry here at Roebuck Church? The PCA has adopted a motto of being faithful to the scriptures, true to the Reformed faith, and obedient to the Great Commission. Well, I think that motto maps on really well to what Paul has laid out here as the goal of Christian ministry. So let's pursue it wholeheartedly. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the glorious gospel of the glorious Lord Jesus. Forgive us of our sins, which puts you on that cross. And thank you for your love. Make us, Lord, loving people, gospel-centered, doing the will of God. Take your word this morning, bear much fruit, and be glorified, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing, lastly then, hymn 499. Is that right? It's 499, the right tune. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, hymn 499. Let's stand. Let's sing this hymn. <laughs>
lift up your hands, lift up your eyes, receive God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.